All right. Uh, happy Tuesday, everyone. It is 9 a.m. Oh, it just ticked to 9.01 uh, a.m. in somewhat sunny Seattle or sunny Seattle for an April day. Uh, I'm joined today by Peter from the product marketing team. Hey, everyone. Uh, Rich Ellis is also joining us today as solutions consultant. Hey, hey, everyone. And we may have a few additional uh, special visitors uh, throughout our hour together today. Uh, for those of you that I have not met before, my name is Jennifer. I work very closely with Peter and product marketing as well. Uh, so we're going to dive a little deeper into AppSheet today. Uh, we're going to start uh, quick with an overview uh, for those that are new to the platform. Uh, and then we'll get a little deeper into some really uh, exciting new features as well as some really fantastic uh, key takeaways, important topics based on a couple of really great use cases uh, that Peter's put together for us. I'm going to start a quick poll in the bottom and I'm going to have Peter um, do a little bit more uh, depth on COVID-19 stuff. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. So, um, and just to reiterate what Jen was describing, we're, we have a, a, a long agenda today. I think there are a bunch of uh, great topics that we can try to um, run through and just explore a couple different apps, uh, see how some of the different uh, functionality has been set up. And we're kind of continuing a, a recent theme of supporting remote workers. So there are lots of us that are um, trying to adapt to kind of new conditions, either working remotely or working from home or just trying to kind of adapt business as usual to you know, be more efficient or, or change our workflows and change our process a little bit. So a lot of that is uh, just supporting teammates uh, in, in uh, different environments than what they may be used to. So, so that's the, the general theme. And we have a, a couple applications around task management, but then also uh, like uh, surveying or, or feedback collection from team members that we can kind of use as a backdrop to dig into specific functionality. Um, and so we'll, uh, we'll dive into that a little bit. Um, right now we're getting uh, some feedback from the poll. And while, while we're doing that, I'll also just call out what Jen mentioned um, and oh, and actually, while we're doing the poll, we can't see this. But <laughs> uh, if you're uh, a couple things to call out, <clears throat> the, we uh, we've collected some some resources for those of you that are uh, working towards uh, 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 different types of solutions to support uh, COVID response. And and so we have a landing page that's available from the community community.appsheet.com. And um, once this poll is done, uh, the, the, the tab we have open here, you'll be able to see there. Um, there we go. Thanks. Um, so this, this page, uh, uh, you can get routed to that from the community. And it just provides a good uh, kind of summary of some re responses. AppSheet is supporting uh, any applications that are, um, are, are helping kind of solve COVID-related issues. And we also have a, a section in the community that people are kind of discussing uh, different ideas there related to it uh, and some sample apps that uh, the AppSheet team and also other creators uh, all around the world are creating and then making available for other teams to use. So just wanted to call that out there. And that is linked in the community. And I'll just uh, bring this back to today's uh, office hours in the community. Uh, there is a, a top post here uh, for office hours today. And this is where, as if you are coming with questions uh, for your applications uh, that, uh, that you know you'd, you'd like right now, or as we run through some of these items, if you're developing questions, it'd be great if you could post those questions here. And we'll be monitoring it pretty closely. Um, and so we can help answer them here. We'll, we'll uh, answer them live during the, the webinar, but also gives us an opportunity to maybe follow up afterwards if we aren't able to get to it and other uh, creators can can contribute their thoughts. I'll call out um, a couple of the applications that we can use as a backdrop to some of these topics is this task management app and then also this like ballot or poll uh, surveying app. Uh, pretty simple, but you can access them here as sample apps uh, if you'd like to uh, copy them or, or view them and follow along today. Perfect. Thank you, Peter. Um, so two quick notes before we dive into feature specifics. 
So it looks like we have quite a few uh, new users to AppSheet, so welcome everyone. 23% uh, of you have not yet built an application, so we hope you're able to take away some great getting started tips and tricks for this. Uh, we can also point you to some great additional resources to help jumpstart your app creation journey. Uh, and 52% of you have created one to three, so you're, this is a really exciting time uh, for you learning the app platform, or excuse me, AppSheet pl as a platform, Again, we hope you find some great tidbits of information in here. Uh, and lastly, I want to make a quick introduction to a special guest joining us right now, uh, Praveen, who's actually one of the uh, co-founders for AppSheet. Praveen, if you'd like to say a quick hello. Oh, hello. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. <laughs> great to be here. <laughs> Excellent. Perfect. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and with that, Peter, if you'd like to get started. Yeah, so the first thing on the agenda item is just to review um, a, a few new features and um, starting with a new data source. And this is something that uh, we just wanted to acknowledge, but that we'll follow up with a little bit more detail um, probably next time around. Um, but the for those of you that are familiar with Smartsheet or that have uh, used Smartsheet as a data source in, um, in AppSheet, um, there are a couple different, the, the primary, uh, you can you can use a Smartsheet as that data source. Uh, there's also an option for creating reports within Smartsheet and those reports now can serve as a data source for an application. So there are some, uh, some teams where that, that becomes uh, really relevant. If it's relevant to you, we're, we're gonna follow up with a little bit more detail there on how to do it and just some examples of um, you know, good use cases there. We wanted to call that out. Um, the second item there, is uh, universally unique identifiers, and um, this is this is kind of an interesting update. This is uh, uh, in and Praveen. I'll be interested to see if you have uh, any additional thoughts here. But I, I have an example of just uh, what this means. Um, UU IDs are a little bit more universally well, universally um, <laughs> a little bit more of a standard. Uh, in regards to unique identifiers um, in, in databases, but just for a lot of platforms. And so AppSheet previously or, or currently has this uh, uh, randomly generated uh, eight uh, character ID um, that is available uh, when you use the expression unique ID. And I'll actually go ahead, we can pull up a quick example of this. And what I've done here is I've just opened up the editor. We'll, we'll uh, step back for a second before we do this again, but just calling out this unique ID process. Um, so in this case, we have an ID column and the expected, the, the um, typical initial value for this would just be um, unique ID. like this. And so oftentimes when you're setting up a new application, if your column label is ID, um, then uh, AppSheet, the editor, when you've connected your data, it'll automatically pre-fill that initial value um, as just unique ID. And this will generate that, that uh, random eight character unique ID that if you've created some applications you may be familiar with. If you add in just UUID, and hit save, That's, this is going to give you, um, when you generate a new row, um, it's gonna uh, create a new task, a new ID that follows this um, new format. And so, <clears throat> um, and this is, uh, I think it's 128 bit, and uh, let's see, I forget what the, the total length is, but um, that you can kind of see the difference between the traditional method or this UUID method. So that's that's available in, in case that's uh, relevant for your team. Um, and uh, just to interrupt, sorry, Peter, that's really yeah. relevant uh, if you're storing data in a SQL database. Um, typically, you want something like a longer ID because that's sort of the default in a SQL database. So um, when AppSheet works against SQL, this is useful. Got it. Thanks, Praveen. And so just moving along here, the last and definitely not the least um, is a preview 
of the um, app theme, a new app theme color picker. And I say preview because it's in the process of rolling out. And so um, this is exciting for a lot of people just in regards to greater control over customizing the branding of your applications. And uh, we've been working hard on trying to figure out the best way of exposing that within the apps um, in an intuitive way that gives people easy controls for, for customizing that. And so um, it's in the process of rolling out now. If you don't see it, you'll, you'll likely see it soon. And we'll leave it at that. Um, let's, let's just pull a, I'll, I'll pull an example of what this looks like. So in, <clears throat> um, in the UX section of the editor, when you go to brand, if you're familiar with uh, the UX and brand section, uh, this is, there have been some, some recent updates here. And one of those um, updates that is, that's rolling out is the color selector. And so giving you a little bit more control over what the theme color of your application is. And so you can, you have kind of new uh, uh, primary color selections, but then there's also the ability uh, to get very granular with either hex or RGB colors um, or just kind of like manually selecting off, off the spectrum. And that pairs really well with also uh, some of the footer, uh, new footer options. And this has been around for, for a little bit now. Um, but I would explore if, if you're thinking about just new ways of kind of uh, styling your application, if you have an application already or if you're building one new, uh, you want to make sure that it matches maybe your organization uh, theme. This will be a good place to to get familiar and then um, uh, get you know uh, see what um, see what you're able to do in, in regards to matching those colors. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, okay. I do have a quick question um, regarding unique ID uh, since we're in the new feature bucket. If if this is a good time for everyone. Sure. Uh, does the unique ID uh, make for better or more robust key columns? Uh, how to transition from unique ID to the new unique ID key columns with my uh, MySQL database? So, my understanding, and Praveen, I guess in regards to how how you're how you're set up with your SQL database, um, Praveen might be able to. Uh, he probably will sure. lend the best insight here. <laughs> sure, I could take a stab at that. Um, uh, UUID is, um, every time you generate one, it's supposed to be globally and universally unique. So it picks from this huge range of uh, possible values. Um, something like, um, uh, it, it's some ginormous number of possible values and the randomness within it guarantees that it's unique. But um, uh, what we did with AppSheet by default is to pick something that was smaller, so it was actually something you could read, you could copy easily, and uh, we limited it down to just eight characters by default. Um, there's still a huge number of possible permutations there, so in reality, the possibility that that isn't unique is so infinitesimally small that has never occurred and will never occur. All those those values that you see there, which are eight characters, are pretty unique. Uh, the reason to go to these longer formats is if you're tying into some broader system that expects such a format. And typically, like in a SQL database, there's built-in data types that go it that will generate um, this kind of format. We just wanted to be able to conform to that, and some customers have asked for it. Um, as a practical matter for the data sizes that we're seeing with AppSheet apps, you're never going to have a conflict whichever approach you pick. Excellent. Great, thank, thank you, Praveen. You. So I guess on, on that note, there are um, we're going to expand on these features and provide some more examples. Uh, we can actually look at the the couple apps that we have open right now to to dig into. Um, we have taken advantage of this new um, uh, theme color picker, so we can kind of look at uh, you know just some of these different styles. But uh, the the smart sheet report um, uh, you'll see it, we'll we'll build more examples of that here moving forward. Um, this this ID, um, I, I think you know we'll probably start incorporating that and just different versions of it um, in throughout some 
sample apps moving forward, but then there are a number of new features that will be added also to next office hours that we'll we'll dig into uh, that are coming out. So um, I guess uh, just to move over the um, we we kind of glossed over oops um, we kind of glossed over getting started with AppSheet. I think that a good place to start just for those of you that are new. Let's open up one of these sample apps and just do kind of a high level look at the editor and just make sure that uh, uh, we're all on the same page about where some of the different functionality is. And then um, uh, Jen and, and Rich, do you wanna, should we uh, start with this task manager and just start digging into some of the um, some of the features we've called out here? Yeah, let's go for it. Okay. Yep, yep, sounds good. All right, so <clears throat> a couple applications that uh, the, the, that we can kind of talk to this, we have this task management and then we also have like a polling app for collecting feedback. Uh, let's open up the task manager. And <clears throat> just to kind of level set and look at this from a high level, the, uh, the app sheet editor, um, really what you're doing, uh, first and foremost is connecting data that you're going to use to, uh, build your application and, and basically build an interface. Uh, uh, for and so the first thing they do generally when you're starting an application right is you start connecting those tables that the application will be based off of in our case today our tables are are just Google Sheets but these could be uh, like Praveen was mentioning it could be a SQL database um, it also could be Excel hosted on OneDrive it could be Smartsheet like we mentioned it could be a Smartsheet report now and so that data um, you want to connect here those tables as you're adding them. You have some initial ways of kind of defining how the application will allow users to interact with those tables. So are you going to be adding data, modifying it, deleting it, or just reading it? And we'll get back to this, but there is also uh, some security settings you can set up initially as those tables are connected. So what rows from this table will users Will, will actually be exposed to those end app users. And as those tables are connected, then you start uh, also wanting to get more granularly, granular about how each column within those tables are defined, uh, what type of data is it, and then, um, and then how to expose those rows throughout the application. So elsewhere in the application, as you're building views and as you're building uh, behaviors and workflows. Um, how will this? Uh, how will those columns end up actually showing up uh, elsewhere throughout the application? And this is something that, um, as your data is connected, the AppSheet editor is recognizing. It has seen thousands and thousands of similarly structured tables, and so it's trying to anticipate what those column types are. And you'll notice that sometimes it will. Uh, guess what a good initial value will be for those columns. Um, and so there's, uh, when you first start your application, when you first uh, start AppSheet and a prototype is generated, you'll see that some of that is pre-filled, but it's always good to kind of go through this in detail, take a good pass, get your, your first setup of these columns, but then expect as you start moving forward and building uh, views for your application and, uh, you know, kind of adjusting the format of those views and then building actions and which are like buttons and workflows that you're going to be going back and forth between those columns and saying like oh actually now i realize um you know I'd, I'd only like to show this column in this view but not this view and so i need to go define that back in my data structure um, or I, I want to make sure that i have an initial value that helps people move this form along more quickly so uh, you always go back and forth um, uh, as you're as you're setting up that data. So what Peter is saying here, he's saying kind of casually, but it's really important to know just how powerful your data is in the app sheet editor. Um, this is a really good sign. We talk about designing your data quite a lot uh, with the app sheet platform. This is exactly what happens when you structure your data in such a way um, that it's it works so well with AppSheet that you have this really beautiful end user application uh, to achieve a number um, of different tasks or 
operations. In this case, it happens to be a task manager. So we might say this somewhat casually or say, you know, it just takes a little bit of time to perform these actions, but this is a really, really powerful tool. I just can't emphasize that enough. And for those that heard terms like UX and view types and columns and tables, and you're like, what is he talking about? Um, I actually just posted a link uh, in that community thread for a resource, a resource, excuse me, on learning some of these uh, great 101 level or starter level uh, features and functionality, uh, functionality, excuse me, of AppSheet and the editor as well. Thanks, Jen. So. <clears throat> I think um, maybe maybe I'll just reiterate this, and then let's let's start moving into some of the the features that we we put down on the agenda that I think are especially relevant to this app. And then we can gradually move into this the second application. Um, but uh, may, yeah, maybe just to reiterate what we're looking at right here is a it's really simply um, just a table of tasks, and I also have a table of tags different types of tasks so we'll see how that's connected so those are the two tables connected in this app there's really just a single primary view of those tasks and so as ta as views are being created right you are you're always creating them um, you're creating views you're creating behaviors and it always is um, uh, associated with a particular table that you've connected in this case, we'll we'll mention what this slice is doing, and then a behavior that was automatically created is this plus sign, and this brings you to the form, and this is how we're adding tasks, new rows to that task table. Um, and so I've uh, changed a variety of things here and kind of customized a variety of things just to try to make this task manager as simple as possible, but also have some uh, some kind of smarts bit, uh, baked into it um, behind the scenes. So let's let's start kind of poking around at, at how some of that has been created. And I think just starting with um, some of the initial values may be a good place to start. Um, so let's um, actually I'll, I'll, let's just demonstrate um, what one of these options are. So. Um, Let's just let's see like what happens as we're adding a task. We have a variety. Uh, I guess one one thing that's that's unique about these tasks, just uh, and then and then we'll let's dig into it. Is you can have tasks that have um, that repeat or that don't repeat. So if you're not repeating, you have a specific due date and time. But if it does repeat, then it's just going to remind you uh, every inter every interval. Or at least it'll show up. It'll be prior, a prioritized task of every interval that you've specified. Um, so an example might be if we want, if we need to, um, you know, perform maintenance on the truck. And then let's see. I think I've got a picture of a truck here. Great. And then I'm going to categorize this as shipping and logistics. And then, you know, starting right now, let's say this is the, my normal time that I do the maintenance on the truck. I want this to repeat every, um, let's just say every two days. And this I've kind of left um, just with hours and minutes. We could get a little bit more elaborate with how we um, kind of set these reminders or So when I save that, and I go back. You can see the latest row here is that task. Perform maintenance on the truck. All right, so let's look look at how this shows up in the app. You can see right now I I have even a label here that's that's already telling me well how long since the last check. So it's just looking at I'm logging like a last activity. Uh, date and time, and so we'll look at how it's calculating this. Save the image. This is displaying that detail view. It's got the category, and then uh, we have some actions here to basically like I can I can close this, I can um, check it, and that just reset the time. It that just logged 
okay, I, let's say I just checked the truck right now. Now it's been three seconds since I last checked the truck. So we'll look, we'll look at how some of this is set up. Um, something that is also kind of interesting about this is, you know, I just pour, I just jotted down like perform maintenance on the truck. And maybe as my tasks accumulate, um, you know, I might get to the point where I was like, ah, I needed to do, I need to do some maintenance on the truck and I forget which truck it was, but I took a picture of the truck. And so if I, you know, if I say like, well, I've got, you know, like I see the truck in front of me, I, I can't remember if it was this truck or a different truck. And so if I search for, let's say the truck ID number that's on, on the side of the truck, I'm actually, I can find that result because I took a picture of the truck and behind the scenes, I'm using an OCR text extraction to basically save some metadata. That truck number right here is on the side of the truck. So it's pulling out the, the data from this picture and then is actually saving that behind the scenes, giving me the ability to then search for anything that's in the picture I took. And Peter, what does OCR stand for? Yeah, so uh, that is optical character recognition, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Anyone else? Uh, I'm pretty yeah, sure that that's it. That's right. Yeah. So let's let's just look at uh, you know some of these these fields that are being filled out. Um, let's look at how they're set up. And and maybe we can start with uh, let's look at this form, and we can just kind of run through what's visible here. Um, but then um, you know uh, Rich and Jen stop me stop me along the way here. Um, if if you want to call anything out, so first and foremost, this this task ID, this is what we looked at to begin with, and it's text, and we just changed it to go ahead and and use this new ID format. So we've added that UU ID in there. It's not as critical in this case, especially considering we don't have that many tasks. This is not connected to a SQL database. It's not really it doesn't really require this. It's just a little bit more random or a lot more random than the already random ID that you'd otherwise be using. The task itself is, um, oh, and actually I made a mistake here. Right now the row number is set to be the key, but we should move that over. We want the actual ID to be the key for this table. And, and why don't you want it, uh, the row number to be the key? Yeah, so good. So so frequently, like it, if if you don't have an ID already accounted for in your data, then you know apps you might select your row number. But ideally, you have this ID. Uh, the row number, if you if your rows ever change, or if the data ever move, if you ever move the data around in your uh, spreadsheet, then all of a sudden the row number will become associated with a different um, row of data. Um, and that uh, then if you have related items, so for example, comments or tags, or um, then then those will get disconnected. Is that, uh, is that, is that, that sounds right, Rich? Yeah, yeah, that makes, makes sense. Yeah, uh, very rare circumstances would you ever use row number unless you just had a single column of reference data. Got it. So in the, um, uh, so for that task, just kind of open text field, that makes sense. The image is just kind of an open image field. And setting this up, you want to make sure that you selected that right column type. So in this case, image will give the give you the option to, you know, on your laptop or your mobile device, you can open up and either take a picture or upload an image from your gallery, kind of depending on what your device allows. And you can, you can actually adjust those settings um, in uh, uh, UX settings. What's what's the difference between image and drawing? <laughs> see both of them yeah. on there. So have you? Um, let's see. Let's let, let's just change it and check it out. So it kind of changes the input a little bit. And you have to tap to unlock it. But then, um, right? You can. This is a, this is a little difficult from my laptop when I have my little trackpad here. You can jot down notes. You can just draw something. Let's see if I can draw a truck. Okay, this is pretty bad. Um, <laughs> but the uh, uh, main idea here is, and actually a better use case for this, is you can upload an image and then you can annotate it. So if I went back to that truck 
and I had something specific about this that I wanted to kind of call out, like, oh, maybe the you know the front left tire is flat. Uh, maybe that can be my task. So that's handy. Maybe we should just leave that as drawing. Um, I think. I think it looks great. Leave it. <laughs> <laughs> for the sake of this next field, though, let's. Um, I want to keep it an image just to make sure I don't break it, which is uh, keywords. And this is where it's actually getting kind of fancy by using this OCR text function. So the goal here is um, there's an expression called OCR text. And what this expression helps you do is basically, oh, there we go. Um, all it's saying is it's going to produce, it's going to look for any text it can identify, just kind of bulk text um, from an image column. And in our case, our image column is just called image. And that's what is going to be saved as the initial value for this keywords column. And what I've also done is because um, we're just doing kind of like a raw output of text here, it's not super relevant to be shown in this form. We want to keep this form pretty streamlined. Really, the only reason I'm doing this is for the search functionality later on. And so I've also added a condition here that says, um, actually don't even show this row or uh, this field um, in forms. And so what this, this is another expression, context expression, which is great. And what I'm saying here is uh, we're, we're saying for uh, uh, looking at the view type, um, if the, the view type, um, or yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, Basically, if the uh, um, as long as the view type is not equal to form, then you can show this field. This is one one uh, way of a few different ways that you can hide uh, different fields, um, especially from your form. In this case, I I don't necessarily want to just turn it off entirely, which is another option. I want to leave the uh, leave it open to potentially show that field somewhere else later on. And then um, I'm actually doing that similarly with the status. So the status of these tasks, um, I'm using some actions, some change data actions to change the status as opposed to um, another option, another kind of typical option that you might use for changing a status would be like an enum uh, drop down. So you have like multiple or, or a toggle, like a drop down choices um, for that status. In this case, we're also hiding that form, the status uh, from the form, and we're just setting the initial value to uh, to do. So, so if the assumption is if you're adding a new task. The, the the new um, the new status of that task will always be to do. All right, so um, I, I want to just pause for a second. There's a lot. I don't want to go through every single row here in detail, but we let's let's call out a few other things. Um, but I want to pause. Uh, Jen, are there any um, uh, questions? Just as we start looking at this app, we can yeah. uh, address. Yeah. Yeah, I got a couple for you. Um, so one, speaking of images and uh, drawing, so a question about signatures. Um, is drawing the best option for recording a signature, uh, for example, in a delivery application? Yeah, so uh, great. And actually, Rich, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and try to add a signature um, column here. Would you, uh, have you been using signatures much in your apps lately? Or can you describe a little bit about uh, how to approach those? Yeah, so there, there's a special uh, there's a special sig signature column type that you can select. So in addition to the the drawing and image column types, you can choose signature as well. And signature is very similar to drawing in that you can draw with your finger or a stylus or whatever you know you interact with on your phone. And but unlike drawing, you can't add a picture to it. It's purely just your finger on the on the phone. So you would select the signature column type as a as the option for recording signatures. Um, so I just I just went into the table and I added a new column. 
um, which if I um, if I try to keep working the editor, right, it's going to wreck it. It's going to break the app because all of a sudden my data structure has changed. And so if this is happening, if this has happened to you, or if, if it, uh, it will happen to you at some point as you're kind of modifying your app. And so you, what you want to do is regenerate that table structure right here in the column um, settings. Oops. Oh, I think, all right, let me fix something real quick here. So what's happening right now is Peter, um, something in the application tripped an error and a warning, and it's telling him where to go look to find um, what happened. So just a heads up, if you ever come across a situation like this, you can follow the prompts at the top and they'll help guide you uh, to how to correct your, your error or um, the mistake that caused your application to, to load like that. Cool, so and now you can see that that column that I just added to my data, after I regenerated, it's been added and it's called signature. So logically, you know, that's, that's an easy one to recognize, column type, has automatically been selected as signature. And um, let's see, now in my form, I wonder. Your slice, not. Oh uh, yeah, that's good. Add it, add it to the slice. Let's, let's talk about slices. Thanks, Rich. <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> Um, this always gets me. Um, so what we've done here is we've talked about tables and these columns, and th this is pretty straightforward. We have a bunch of tasks. Um, slices are uh, basically a, a filtered uh, table. And so this is just, a, it's like a virtual table, but it's really just taking a look at one of your tables and saying, okay, only expose the rows uh, that um, uh, that meet this these criteria, that meet this condition. And so this this expression is a little bit uh, convoluted, um, but it's basically this is a way of showing uh, any t any task that the status is to do, so it still needs to be done, or it is recently done. It's done, um, and the the uh, it's been updated in the past 24 hours, basically. So then that way, um, what we're doing is we're pulling in and just showing, okay, what needs to be done or what has recently been done, and that's what we're showing here. So that's that's how we're able to see. Oh, I, we actually checked this off the list. Um, this is a way that then you can uh, at least confirm, like, okay, it doesn't. If you check thing something off the list. And you have it in a slice it doesn't just disappear entirely um, you can kind of uh, acknowledge okay yep I recently did that now what happened is when when I made this slice um, slice columns are set up to be custom and so that will kind of manually fix the columns that are being pulled from that table and also the order and so I think if we switch over rich if we just switch over to all columns you think that'll uh, bring in the new ones yeah, I think that'll that'll fix it. Um, okay. Yeah, nine times out of ten for everyone on the call, it's if you're for some reason you can't figure out why that column's not showing up that you just added. It's yeah, it's somehow not showing in the slice, or your your their detail view doesn't doesn't have it enabled, which we haven't really gotten into detail view. So, but yeah. So uh, so there it is. Um, and that was, you know, we just added that signature column, probably not super relevant for task management. And you can see my beautiful trackpad uh, signature there. Um, now that's just going to save it, Rich, like you were saying, that just saves it as an image, right? Yeah, that's correct. Save that as an image. So you'd want to combine this with a couple other, you know, fields to help capture that signature. You know, basically when the signature was filled in and even location uh capture location data and yeah. um that way you kind of have a little bit more information behind the, the scribble got it cool 
So <clears throat> I let's um I want to call out uh, just real quickly the security filters with this, and then also some actions, and then then can we jump over to this other uh, app? And then is that does that sound okay with you guys? Sounds great. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it'll work. So the um, similar to the slice, and I think it's always good to call out the um, the security and also performance uh, aspects of security filters versus slices. Um, because when you're thinking about your data, slices, like this seems like a way that you could really limit the amount of data that's exposed in your application um, for performance reasons and for security reasons. But if you're starting to go down that path, it's best to think first about these security filters that we kind of alluded to to begin with. So in your table settings in security, in this example, very simply, like if I'm making a new task, um, I'm by default, I'm the owner. So the initial value of this field is user email. And so it's, it recognizes who's logging in and it assigns it to me. But I could assign this, you know, to Rich. And if I did that, then Rich would have, when he opens up his app, um, you know, we want to make sure that he just sees those tasks assigned to him and I only see the ones assigned to me. And so we're doing that through a security filter here. You could do it as a slice, but the security filter is going to be the most secure option. And also as you really accumulate a lot of data here, it's going to be the best for uh, performance. Rich, is that um, is that a good way of describing it? Is that also kind of how you approach the apps you make? Oh, sorry, I muted myself, my bad. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, to give more context to that, think about this. You would use security filters. Um, imagine a task app where you have 2,000 people using tasks, right? So they accumulate potentially tens of thousands of tasks in a task list. By including this security filter in the window, the most tasks that an individual user will ever need to download to their device are just their tasks. So, so they're not having to download the whole table. And that's the important difference between a slice and a security filter. Security filters will improve performance of your app and also increase security as well because uh, people won't download what they're not authorized to download. Slices are a way to just mask data that users have already downloaded. So in, in a way, you would say that this functionality is able to change the content based on the user that's logged in. Right. Yes. Right. It's, it's a way to provide context to the user. And, you know, th this also highlights another key aspect when you're developing apps. Really doesn't matter for very simple apps, but as you develop more and more complex apps, the more you can do things at the table level and at the column level without having to introduce slices, the easier it becomes to make adjustments, you know, app wide in a more complex app. That's kind of one of the, um, you know, the, the positive feedback loops in AppSheet is if you, you, you think about it from the table level up to the view level and you design, starting with the table level, you'll, you'll have much more efficient experience as you add more features to your apps. Got it, yeah. So, and uh, just in the background here, Rich, I'm, I'm making a task, uh, just real basic entry here, and I'm setting you as the owner. And so when I save that, you can see that the security filter in action, that it actually like that new row is not showing up for me because I'm logged in as Peter at AppSheet. But if we switch over and view this as if you were using the app, um, that is. shows up. That's, that's what will show up for you. So this is a good thing to get familiar with, especially as you start playing around with those security filters or slices. and um, I, I think that may be a good um, moment to transition over to this other application to keep thinking about how to only expose uh, information or views or uh, a data that's relevant to that end user. Um, and so let's just take a second to switch over. And, and guys, if there's anything else that you wanted to jump back to on that, let me know. This is a... Um, separate app, real simple. This is another one that I linked in the community. 
but it's um, it's just a way of creating polling options. So if you wanted, if you had a team of people and you wanted the team to select uh, their preferences for some options, you're providing those options, and then you're also providing a form for each user to you know, select. In this case, giving giving them three options to select from. So in this scenario, one one thing that we've done, and this gets more into kind of the user interface and how how only what's relevant gets exposed. Um, we're using virtual column in order to um, in order to determine okay what um, kind of like what are the counts of votes and we're actually we have a vote table connected so we're logging let's let's open this up we can keep track of who is um, who's making those votes And then on the views that we have created, and we can poke around in these a little bit to see how they're set up. We have, let's see. Um, so Peter, while you're pulling this up, Rich, um, what is a virtual column? Yeah, so a virtual column for everyone is a, a column that doesn't exist in your data table. You can create these columns and they they essentially compute on the fly or in real time as the app is synced. So this data um, will, will typically pull from other data that you have in your table and you can use it to add additional context, create, you know, combinations of multiple columns together to show in one line, for example, or uh, do count functions and, and some functions or, or anything that you could imagine uh, that you would typically, you could do with a, a calculation and just have the app do it on the fly. The one, you know, it is important to remember that when you're using virtual columns that if you start to have a lot of rows that need to be computed, um, you could, take a performance hit in your apps as well. So it's just something to watch out for. Um, use it when you need to, but I definitely encourage uh, that these are created over creating columns in your, your data set. But just be warned that if you notice that all of a sudden your app starts to get really slow after you've added virtual columns, then the virtual column is more likely the, the culprit. Thanks, Rich. Yeah, and so uh, to clarify here, in this example, right, we have um, a couple main tables. One is just what are our options we're presenting people, and then we're giving them the ability to fill out a form and log uh, their votes for those different options. And so, in those actual the the submissions, this is what we're voting on. Nowhere in the table do we have a column saying like calculating okay, well, how many votes are there for this row? That's being calculated with a virtual column. And that happens to be this one, vote count. And so what we're looking at here, this is a little bit uh, more convoluted than like a, a, a way you'd start out, but it's basically just saying, because people are getting three votes, so there are three different fields, it's saying count um, the number of related votes and then add it to the count of the related votes in the second column and then the count of the related votes in the third column because we're giving people the ability to vote three times vote one vote two vote three so it's just saying for each row go count how many times it's here count how many times it's here count how many times it's here and then that's what we're um that's what we're adding together here uh, for that total vote count. Now, the um, so thinking about how to use those virtual columns in order to kind of like you know uh, calculate, um, um, make calculations related to the those rows. That is that can be really relevant, but it's also um, uh, and a similar expression is being used to basically expose this vote. Pull this form 
only to people that haven't voted yet. And so when we think about like, okay, I only want to see what is relevant to the user. Um, if we look, we're in we're in the UX section. We've opened up this particular view, which is a form view. And this form is letting people add rows to the votes table. If I go down here to the show if condition, um, whoops. The expression here that, that we're using is, uh, you know, does the, and actually, I'm gonna have to interpret this. <laughs> um, it's basically looking at, oh, okay, here we go. So does the, the person that's logged in, and that you can you can access this to get dig in and kind of explore this example a little bit from that community post. But it's basically just saying is look at the user who's logged in right now. And if they have voted, if their name is already in that votes table, then don't show this view for them anymore. So let's let's go ahead and just try that out. So if I vote for option one and option four and option five. It's logging who's logged in right now. When I hit that save, it added that as a row here, logged those votes. And now in the application, you can see it actually just removed that option, that view. Um, so the onboarding view, which is on the left, and then also that vote view just removed entirely. And I'm left only with the options view. And it actually now is showing me that total tally along with a chart of vote results. So it it, uh, it just recognizes the context of, okay, who's logged in right now? What have they done? Do they have data that's related to them? And then only show them what's what's relevant. Um, so this is just kind of like a unique way of, of manipulating that. Um, so there was a, a question earlier that touches on this. It said, I've used slices extensively to hide columns in certain views. Would it be more efficient to use context? So we talked about slices a little bit. We just touched on context. Um, Rich, would you like to do a quick, like one yeah. sentence summary of the difference between the two? Yeah, um, you could certainly use slices to hide columns. However, I think the most efficient way to, to do it in the app, if you're purely needing to just hi, uh, hide a column that you've created, is to use the context option in your show if, um, show if column. Uh, that would be the most efficient way because essentially you're creating slices just to hide a column and you're you're making your app more complex than it needs to be instead of just adding a, a line item in your your show if condition so hopefully that that makes sense um because it, it adds that middle basically adding a slice adds a middleman between your table and your view and it it, it can lead to things like what we ran into with peter earlier with when we added a column then we we're like why isn't that column showing up and it just adds that little extra layer of friction that if you don't need it to be there, then don't don't create a slice. Well, thank you. Great, yeah, and that um, I, I find myself using this real frequently. So this this context, um, you know, in this case, that that vote count calculation we were talking about, um, I don't really want it exposed. It, it that virtual column will appear in the form as I'm, you know, submitting. A new option here, and it's it'd be completely irrelevant there. So that's that would be like what Rich is describing. Um, this basically just says if the view type like don't show it if the view type equals form. Um, uh, and there are a few different ways you can frame this. There's also um, Rich. Do you use other the other uh, context expression? I use a fair amount is post. Um, yeah. Have you, have you used that much in your apps? Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah. what, what Peter's talking about here um, is if you know your, your app's going to be mobile and desktop, then you'd want to use this host context where you can define whether your host is a device or your host is the browser. Um, in some situations, there's a third option, which would be a server. Um, that's a very unique situation. So I'll just focus on the browser and device. So you'd use device if you only wanted a view or a column or, or something 
to show up on a, on a mobile device, uh, so iOS or Android. So you can create specific views for those devices, and when a user logs in, they'll get a, a certain mobile view. And then, for example, if they log in as a, in the browser on the desktop, they might see dashboard views, um, because dashboard views really aren't you know, suited for the mobile device too, too much. So you might create those situations where you create a dashboard view for your, your desktop users and then regular views for your um, uh, mobile devices. Yeah, that's that's great. That definitely seems, that's um, probably what I'm, what I'm using most. Context for removing fields from forms that, that just don't need to be there. And then also, um, yeah, like building dashboards and then just making sure that those dashboards only show up if someone is accessing their app as a web app from their browser. Yeah, I think a good a good theme uh, with a lot of these features that we're talking about today is is trying to think about and talk to your users as you're developing uh, these apps for them, um, trying to see what they actually need to try to understand what they actually need to see and do, and then hiding everything else that it doesn't that isn't relevant for their actions to create a more simpler experience for them, and then uh, you know a, a more tailored experience for other folks as well. And and maybe a, just just to kind of close that idea, something else that's been done in this application, um, if right, is taking advantage of some of these new branding uh, style options. And so, um, primary color uh, has been selected, and that's been customized with this new color picker. That if you don't have now, it'll be rolling out soon for you. Um, and then I've just added, I've made sure that that matches with the app logo theme and even the kind of animation, the, the loading animation that goes in um, as it's syncing. And then uh, you can see I've turned on the footer color so that kind of aligns. And we're actually, we're showing the logo in the header. And for this particular app, we don't need the menu or the search for anything. And so we've just removed that here. We've hidden it. Uh, and it just kind of makes for a cleaner interface and just uh, is less distracting. Um, Jen, are there, um, and we're, we're quickly coming to the end of the hour here, but can, uh, are there any uh, good questions we can, we can try to jump into? Yeah. Um, do you want to focus on questions for this application specifically or the broader questions? Uh, let's, let's jump around whatever, uh, whatever people are asking. All right. So, um, Ron, uh, asks, if there's any information on getting uh, started with AppSheet, including um, getting started with AppSheet seminar of some sort, um, I, I can tackle this one really quickly. Uh, Ron and to others who are new to AppSheet, uh, there's a link actually posted in this office hours thread uh, for a resource on getting started. Peter's also highlighting the AppSheet Academy, which is a free Udemy course. Uh, it's about an hour and a half long, and it teaches you all the fundamental building blocks on getting started with AppSheet as a platform to better set you up for success in your application uh, development journey. So yeah, if you have questions about that, feel free to ping us, uh, but that's a great place to start. Uh, next question, uh, we've got actually quite a few questions on uh, table, relational tables and references. Um, Jenny, asks, or Jenny asks, excuse me, what if the user email is in a relational table? Uh, do you need the security filter on both tables? Ooh, um, Rich. Not sure I, so, oh, I, I get it. So. So if, if you have data in, in both two different tables and you want to filter to show the data relevant to those email addresses in each of those tables, yes, you would need a security filter for each table. So so typically, if, if you know your, your tables are going to grow or you're going to require security, you'll need to make sure you include your relevant columns there that you can use to set those security filters appropriately. So this might, and this might be a real simple example. It's not set up that way right now, but we have a table of projects and we also have a, a table of team members. Um, and so if we really wanted to um, filter out and only show projects and team member details, you know, for the person logged in, 
um, that security filter would have to happen in both places. Is that? Yeah, I, I think that, yeah, uh, you know, a more, I guess more generic example would be a parent-child relationship. So if you have a, a table that essentially has the project level data in this case, and then maybe a, a table that includes the tasks related to that project, mm -hmm. and you would need a set of security filter for both of those tables, yes. <clears throat> Got it. So. One, maybe just on the topic, and well, and actually, um, Jen, do you want to, for, uh, we can um, uh, maybe hang around for another uh, five or 10 minutes just to, to continue with some of these questions, but should we, should we uh, wrap up for those people that have to leave? Yeah, uh, that sounds great. Uh, for those that have to jump off, it is just after 10 o'clock. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Please stay safe. Uh, let us know if there's anything we can provide for you uh, on the app sheet side of things. Um, do stop by our community. The three of us are all very active in that source, excuse me, in that platform, and you'll be able to find resources for both uh, the COVID-related applications Peter touched on on the top of the hour, as well as follow up to the questions you all have asked today. Great, thanks everyone. And maybe um, if Jen and Rich, if you guys have a few more minutes, we could we could take a few more questions and then uh, follow up with other folks in the community afterward. Does that sound good? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, one other thing I guess I, I was going to call out related to those uh, references, and this is not not really part of the question, but just to to make sure it's clear. Um, this is an example. We have projects, and then we also have a a table of people and um, so there's a relationship between these tables every project has a project owner and there's a there's a relationship there's a reference and the reference is set up as in uh, it's a ref column type and then the table that it's referencing is selected in that column definition now we also have a virtual column and this is a good example of a dereference, which is basically just saying, so I've made a virtual column, I'm calling it owner headshot. And the expression for this virtual column is, um, look at the owner column, because that is referencing the people table. And then we're dereferencing the um, a, diff a column within the people table called headshot. And so the value that this virtual column will produce is the image of the headshot of the person from this table. Um, now, so so this is this is a way that then um, in this table we don't actually have to have another you know, uh, you know like actual column in the table that would be redundant to the headshot column or the or the uh, uh, that is in the people table. And so it virtually can be incorporated into this into this table. Um, now, what's in the works right now is actually to do a like a nested dereference. And I'll just we can tease that and then come back to it later. Um, that gives you the ability to basically look three tables away. So instead of just pulling a, a column like a headshot column from the people table, maybe the people are also related to um, you know comments. And so you wanted to reference the latest comment um, through the people table if the comments were not also related to the to the project. So that that may be getting a little bit um, uh, too far too far ahead, but I, I think it's just good thing to be good things to be thinking about um, in relation to you know how to use these uh, uh, references and dereferences, and then uh, we'll 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 try to provide some examples of this new concept of nested dereferences in AppSheet. And one, one additional note, since we were kind of just talking about security filters as well, virtual columns cannot be used as a security filter. Um, so just, just remember that they, it, they, they, they don't work because security filters are what the app uses to query directly to the database. So uh, if any of those ideas popped up, I just wanted to warn, you know, that you're not going to, be able to use a, I mean, they'll let you put in a security filter, but it won't return any benefits for you. Got it. Thanks. I see it. I see a couple um, 
there are definitely some questions I think we'll have to like get back to and, and uh, mention in the community. But um, let's see, OCR with handwritten notes. Was that one of them? I'm, um, that that works. It just kind of, you know, the um, uh, the efficiency of it just kind of depends on the <laughs> the handwriting. Yeah. For my handwriting, it's not, you know, it has a lot harder time with my handwriting. I'll leave, I'll say that. <laughs> But, yeah, that that that's a good one. I have a sample app in the works that works fairly well, where you could take a a handwritten list and take a snapshot of that, and it'll basically compute that into a task list in your app directly. So it's certainly possible to do that. Very cool. Yeah, and so um, we can just pull up another example here. Let's see if um, I'm trying to think of. So here's a picture of a book. Um, this is another example of this OCR text. So you can see there's a variety of different texts here, and maybe I just like create a task saying read the book or read this book. And then later on, I'm I'm assigning this to you, Rich. And then later on, you're like, ah, oh, Peter mentioned some book, and I don't really remember what it was. Um, but I think it was, you know, uh, uh, like I think the author was something nap. And if you search for nap, right, this is another case where it has just extracted the text, um, you know, from this image and then, uh, and then allows, because it's saving that the kind of in the background, you can use that for your search functionality. Um, Okay, I think Jen, if there's anything else that you think is is real important to touch on, otherwise I think there are a few other good questions that we can kind of follow up with people individually. And, and uh, I would just encourage anyone else that's still on the call, if you want to poke around and look, there's a lot more that we didn't talk about in these applications, but if you want to copy either of these as a sample app, they're linked in the community thread um, and you can, you can copy them there. But, um, Jen, was there anything else uh, re relevant here that you wanted to make sure we got to? I think that uh, we're at a great place to wrap up for this session. Great. Rich, uh, anything else uh, you'd like to jump in with? Uh, I don't have anything else. Um, I was happy being on. Yeah, we're, uh, we appreciate your insights. Um, so with that, I guess, um, yeah, thanks for hanging around a few more minutes. I know we went a little over, but uh, hopefully this was useful for everyone. I think we're going to wrap up and we'll plan on uh, uh, rejoining in a couple weeks to dig into some of these new features. There are going to be a few more that we're, we'll go over. Um, and we'll probably have some new sample apps that we can we can dig into and look at examples of, of it all. all. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Peter, Rich, and Praveen for joining. Stay safe, everyone, and we'll see you all on the community. Right.